very good to see you all this morning. If you have any questions about the lesson, feel free to ask afterward. I'd like us to begin in Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation 2.10, the Lord is speaking to the church at Smyrna, and he tells them this. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. The saints at Smyrna were about to suffer persecution for their faith. The Roman government was pursuing Christians to punish them for their faith, refusal to give in to the paganism of Rome. And the Lord tells the saints at Smyrna that some of them are going to go to prison. And that prison in Rome would not be like a prison today. Prison today is much more comfortable. They provide many more things for prisoners today than what ancient Rome would have, especially for one who's considered an enemy of the state. And he says there that some of them would even die because he admonishes them, be faithful until death, to the point of death. You're going to experience affliction and suffering. Some will go to prison. Some, even to that point of death, but remain faithful unto the point of death. But do you notice how he started it out in verse 10 there? Do not fear. That's the message that's being given to them. In spite of what you're going to face, in spite of what you will go through, in spite of that experience, do not fear because your suffering is only temporary. But that crown of life that is promised, that is eternal. We've all experienced fear in our life. If you have never experienced fear, then I would say you're unique among mortals. Because we've all had it. And you can tell me afterward if you've never had it. And we have to have another conversation about being honest. But sometimes fear consumes us. It overwhelms us. It takes control of our thoughts and of our actions, of our behaviors day by day. And many times that's completely to our shame. Because we work something up in our mind that never comes about, that never materializes in our life. Or it's not as bad as we thought it would be. The Bible teaches us not to fear. It's repeated again and again from the beginning to the very end as we've seen here in the book of Revelation. We read things like do not fear, fear not, time and time again. In this lesson that I've titled The Poison of Fear, we're going to look at some examples from the Bible of people of God who experienced fear and gave in to that fear. When they gave in to that fear, the record tells us that it's shameful for them. And we want to look at these things and draw lessons out of it so that we can push fear out of our life and live a life of faith, a life of commitment to the Lord that drives and dominates our life instead of that emotion of anxiety and fear. So we begin by looking at Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, we read of an account where Abram, as he's called here, go to, goes down to Egypt and he lies about his wife, Sarai, as she's called here, or we know her better, of course, as Sarah. In Genesis chapter 12, let's begin reading in verse 10. Let's read all the way down through verse 20 to get the account that's recorded for us here. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt, 
that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So we see in this account that circumstances of life brought about this famine in the land of Canaan where Abram had traveled to be. And it drove him to go down into the land of Egypt. But as he is about to enter into Egypt, the account tells us that he turns to Sarah and tells her, you need to say you're my sister. Because they're going to see how beautiful you are and they're going to kill me. They're going to take you. And that'll be the end of me. So he is concerned about that. And so Sarah, when they get down there, it does indeed unfold that she is seen as a very beautiful woman and Pharaoh takes her to her house, to his house. And then Pharaoh's house is plagued as a result of that. And Sarah is given back and Abraham is sent out of Egypt. And we understand here that Abram fears bodily harm. He fears a physical attack on himself. One of the things we know is that at the beginning of chapter 12, God had made promises to Abram. Where he said in verse 1, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Down in verse 7 it says this, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land, and there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. God had made promises to Abraham, and Abraham has forgotten those promises, or he is not focused on those promises. As he's going down into the land of Egypt, he's thinking he's going to die. And if he dies at this point, he has no heirs. He has no children at all at this point. So he's forgotten that God told him he would have descendants, that he would have heirs, that he would be the one through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed. It's because he feared that bodily harm. Now let's understand that that fear was a real fear. It would not have been unusual in ancient times for someone to, who, in the position of Pharaoh to decide that he wants a certain woman and whoever stood in his way, he would get rid of them. That's not like Abraham is just irrational here. But he's not putting his focus and his faith on God and the promises. And of course, the consequences that unfold out of this is Sarah's in a compromising position. As she's been taken over to Pharaoh's house, she's in trouble there of what might unfold and end up committing adultery. And then Pharaoh's house suffered. It says that Pharaoh and his house were plagued. They were greatly plagued. So they suffered because Abram lied about his wife. And then, of course, there's the shame of Abram. This isn't the first time, or isn't the last time that he did this, I should say. But he did it again later. That he lies about her again. That fear that overwhelmed him and consumed him and drove his actions. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12 and notice another example here. 
in 1 Kings chapter 12, you have the account of the kingdom of Israel being split in two between the northern and the southern kingdom. And what happens after that kingdom splits is the southern kingdom goes into idolatry, goes into a false religion. This is because Jeroboam was fearful of what was about to happen or what he thought might happen. I want you to notice, if you will, to back up to 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 31, where Ahijah the prophet has gone out to Jeroboam in the field and he has taken a garment and ripped it into 12 pieces. And just notice what it says in 1 Kings eleven thirty-one. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. You're going to be the ruler of those tribes. Verse 33, Because they have forsaken me and worshipped the Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the people of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes to keep my statutes and my judgments as did his father David. And then if you jump on down a little bit further to verse 35. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you ten tribes. So God promised that he would do that. In chapter 12 verse 20 that's exactly what unfolds. So you have the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom being ruled by Jeroboam, first king of that nation. Now let's begin now in verse 26, 1 Kings 12, verse 26. And notice what happens in Jeroboam's mind and then what results. It says, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines in the high places and he made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month like the feast that was in Judah and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel he installed the priest of the high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. So here he is fearing that the people are going to return to, Jerobo uh, to Rehoboam, king of Judah. That if they go back and they observe the feasts that are in the law, they go back, for instance, for Pentecost, they go back for Passover, they go back for various offerings there, then they're going to rekindle those relationships. They'll go back to him as king, and they're going to get rid of me. In fact, he says he feared that they would kill him. So that's his concern, and the way that he resolves that is he asks advice of the people of his counselors. He doesn't go to God. He doesn't seek God's wisdom and God's help, but he goes to the leading elite of the nation, if you will. The experts, if you will. And they tell him, here's what you need to do, Jeroboam. Make two calves. Make the two calves of gold and set up places of worship here in the north. So you set up one at Dan, you set up one at Bethel, you tell the people it's too hard for you to go back to Jerusalem. Don't inconvenience yourself. Come and worship at Dan or go and worship at Bethel. And that will solve the issue. So he made those new places of worship. He appointed priests that were not of the tribe of Levi in direct violation of the law, of course. He set up a false day of worship. So you have a false religion that is established because of fear. 
He feared losing power and control and he ignored God's promise and God's blessing to him. You're going to rule over the northern kingdom. He focused on those circumstances and allowed his mind to get away from him and did not exercise faith. So what's the consequence of this? Well, Jeroboam is the man who plunged the northern kingdom into an existence of idolatry that never was shaken. You read on through the account of 1 Kings and 2 Kings. You look at 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. You see what happened with the northern kingdom? They always existed in idolatry. Sometimes it got worse. Sometimes it went back to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, as it's described. But it never left the idolatry. He doomed a nation to false worship of false gods because of his fear. Let's look at Peter now in the New Testament. Peter. In Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is on trial. He's been arrested. He has now been taken before the Romans after having been put on trial by the Jews. In Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 69, we see that Peter ends up denying Christ. It says, Now when Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And when Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. You know, Peter loved the Lord. I have no doubt of that. Peter was close to Christ in his life. And he had spoken about, Lord, you're telling us that you're going to be betrayed, you're going to go to the cross. I'll not let that happen, Lord. And the Lord rebuked him in Matthew chapter 16 because Peter was thinking like a man instead of thinking about the things of God. But Peter's doing it at least out of the right motivation. We see he cares about the Lord. He wants to protect the Lord in those occasions. So if Peter loved the Lord and he was concerned about him, that's why he's here in the courtyard while the trial is going on not far away. But he feared what was happening. He feared the people who were around him and what would unfold if he stood up. We go to Galatians chapter 2. This is again Peter. Galatians chapter 2. Let's notice the circumstance here. Galatians chapter 2 verse 11 beginning. It says, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. You know, Peter was practicing what was right. He was having fellowship with the Gentiles. He received them and accepted them as brethren in the Lord. He's the one, after all, who taught Cornelius in his household, the first Gentile convert. But when these Judaizing teachers come along, he changed his practice. Pressure's put on him to separate from the Gentiles who were not observing the law. They were simply following the gospel of Jesus Christ, which was acceptable and right and good. But because of the pressure that was put on him, he changed his ways and he separated from them. He feared the Judaizing teachers. You see, Peter feared, first of all, the denial of Christ's suffering and death. He thought, I'm going to be taken. I'm going to be facing the same thing that Jesus is facing. 
Here in Galatians chapter 2, he's simply afraid of rejection of influential people. Just afraid of rejection. Of being condemned and ridiculed, criticized by others. Now Peter's fear, we understand, had consequences. If you read in the account of Luke chapter 22, verse 61, as soon as Peter denied the Lord the third time, it says that the Lord looked at Peter. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. You know that hurt the Lord. When his disciple, even though he knew it was going to happen, you know that hurt him on a personal level. He just denied me. It's something that was shameful in Peter's life and something that was painful in his life as he went out and wept about it. And then in Galatians chapter 2, when he separates himself from the Gentiles, again Paul says in verse 13, the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas, Barnabas a strong, faithful Christian, the son of encouragement, was influenced by Peter to separate from the Gentiles. So Peter led others into sin because of his fear of how others would view him, what they would say about him. You know, Abraham, Jeroboam, and Peter's fears were nothing but wasted energy and anxiety that led to shame and humiliation and a stain on their record. That's what it did. We need to think about these things. If we go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, think about fear. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we are told that there is a fear we are to have. In Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments for this is man's all. We're told to fear God. You need to fear Him. We need to do that. And sometimes people want to very generally explain that away as all that means is just having reverence for God. We are to have reverence for God. And sometimes in the context, it's talking about having a reverence for God. But we need to fear God and fear His wrath. If we live in rebellion against Him, He will punish us in eternity. So we need to fear Him. Fear God and keep His commandments. If we go to Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, and notice verse 28 here with me. Hebrews 12, verse 28. It says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. It makes sense to fear God. Because he says we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. As a part of the kingdom of God, we need to serve Him, as it says here, with reverence and godly fear. That makes sense. If we're going to be in His kingdom, we're going to love Him, we're going to honor Him, we need to do that with godly fear. So it just makes sense. Fear of consequences of life especially when it comes to living by God's truth, is harmful. When we fear the consequence of being faithful to God, of serving God, of being dedicated to God, when we fear that consequence, it's harmful. When we fear rejection, when we fear financial loss, when we fear pain and suffering, when we fear sickness or death, it's hurtful to us. There are things that are worse than financial loss. Right? Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. In Mark 8, verse 36, it says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? There are people who are afraid to stand up for truth because it's going to affect them materially. 
monetarily. Maybe they lose business over it. Maybe they get fired. Maybe they get demoted. Whatever it may be, they're afraid of that financial loss, and so they put that above their service to God. And the Lord tells us here, what would it profit a man if you gained the whole world, if you had everything, if you owned it all? and lost your own soul, what good is that? See, there's something worse than financial loss. There's something worse than being rejected. Mark 8, verse 38, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. If we're ashamed of the truth here, we're afraid of what people are going to say about us, what they're going to think about us, how they'll criticize us. We're afraid of that. And so we're ashamed and it drives our behavior so we don't stand up for the truth so that we, won't, we don't speak out. He says, I'm going to be ashamed of you. What does that mean? I'm going to be ashamed of you when the Son of Man comes in His glory with His angels. That means we're going to be cast into hell. There's something worse than the rejection of man. There's something worse than sickness. You go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, we've recently studied this in our Wednesday night class about the lame man at the pool of Bethesda and how that the Lord healed him so that he could walk. And in John chapter 5 verse 14, Jesus tells him this, See, you have been made well, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. He was paralyzed. He could not walk. It was a terrible condition, a terrible physical state to be in. An affliction, if you will. But the Lord tells him, go and sin no more. Because there's something worse than that physical affliction. Something worse than disease. Something worse than being paralyzed. Something worse than being sick. There's something worse than that. And if you're involved in sin, that worst thing is the loss of your soul in eternity. In Hebrews chapter 10 then. Hebrews chapter 10. There's something worse than a painful death. In Hebrews 10, verse 26, beginning, notice this with me. Hebrews 10, verse 26. It says, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Something worse than a painful death as he cites here under the law of Moses by stoning. There, there's something worse than that. <clears throat> and that's suffering the wrath of God in eternity when the Lord comes back and takes vengeance on those who are not loyal and dedicated to Him. <clears throat> you know, there is room in this world to be sensible about our life, about our behaviors, but about the choices we make, precautions we take, things that are reasonable. There's room for that. Like the Apostle Paul when he was at Ephesus and the riot broke out. And Paul wanted to go into that theater, but the brethren talked him out of it. Don't go, Paul. That was a matter of judgment. It was not a command for him to go into that theater. He wanted to do that 
And they said, it's not the wise thing right now. So there's some room in there for those kinds of things. But fear that leads to violating God's will, fear that leads to denying the truth, fear that prevents us from serving God and fulfilling our duty to Him, that kind of fear is destructive to our soul. It's poison. Poison to our soul that corrupts us and robs us of living an enriching life, one that is filled with confidence and joy in the Lord instead of being filled with anxiety and worry. Fear is a poison that leads to compromise your commitment to Christ because it poisons the mind and weakens our resolve to serve the Lord faithfully. We cannot give in to that fear. So I ask this question. What legacy do you want to leave? You look at Jeroboam and how do you think about Jeroboam? Jeroboam is known for his fear and setting up the idolatry in that nation. That's what he's known for. Do you want to be known for leading a life of fear? Do you want to be known as a person who gave in to those anxieties and you compromised on your commitment to the Lord? Now, Abram and Peter are a little different. They gave in to fear at times. But they also renewed their faith and returned to the Lord. So we understand as we began, we all experience fear at one time or another. Different circumstances and what gives you anxiety may not give me anxiety, and what gives me anxiety may not bother you at all. We've all had it. We've all experienced it. Now I'd be utterly shocked if there are those of us in here who could say, you know what? Fear has never caused me to be quiet about the truth or ashamed of the gospel. Fear has never stopped me from serving God like I know I'm supposed to serve God. Fear works on us and it gets to us. But what legacy do we want to leave? Do we want to leave a legacy of boldness and faith in the face of fear? Of pushing that out of our life. Standing firm and steadfast and strong in the Lord. Serving Him diligently day by day. Is that the legacy we want to leave? If you will, open to number 837. 837. I'm going to read one more passage before we draw to a close. We began there in Revelation 2 where the Lord tells the saints in the church at Smyrna, do not fear the things you're about to suffer. He let them face that suffering because He had confidence in them that they could face it and they could get through it, they could overcome it without fear. And the Lord lets us face things in the circumstances of life. He allows us to face things because He has confidence in us, knowing that if we will put our focus and our faith in Him, we can overcome. He wants us to exercise our faith. He desires us to encourage one another, even in the most trying circumstances. And He calls us to be an example of commitment in the culture of compromise. And so I want to read in Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. Words of encouragement from the psalmist and the attitude that you and I need to have. God is our refuge and strength. 
a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. The idea is, even though the world seems to be crumbling around us, and it's frightful when those things are happening, he says, God is our refuge, God is our strength, God is a present help in the midst of trouble, therefore we will not fear. When you put your faith and focus on God, that will push fear out. For those of you who are not Christians, not obey the gospel, not become a part of the Lord's church, we encourage you to do that. Set aside any fears you may have about how people react, your family, your friends, anybody else. Don't worry about how they'll react, what they'll say about you, what's going to happen. <coughs> Confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Repent of your sins. Be baptized to have your sins washed away. As Peter told those people on the day of Pentecost, when they asked Peter, men and brethren, what shall we do? He responded to them in Acts 2.38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It took bravery, it took boldness for those people to take that step that day because they were among the ones who called out for the blood of Christ and they knew that the Jewish leaders were hostile toward the Lord and His followers. And yet it tells us that day about 3,000 people responded, believing, repenting, being baptized, and it says that the Lord added them to the church. So if you've not done that, push aside any fear. Put your faith in the Lord and obey His will. If you're a child of God, we encourage you to lay aside your fears. All the things that we've talked about, don't let them hold you back from doing the Lord's will, honoring Him, including worshiping Him. Lay those things aside. Put your faith in God and honor Him that you may be pleasing in His sight. There's something that you need to confess. Is there action you need to take to draw close to the Lord this morning? Did we invite you to do that, to let it be known? Come forward while we stand and while we sing. Someday you'll